Father in heaven, we want to say once again, here on this beautiful Friday morning, that your love is beautiful and you are beautiful. Today, we just want to lean back. We want to lean into your incredible arms. Be with us, Father. It's the end of the week. It feels good. We're happy about that. And as we now direct our attention to you, to your goodness, you're a good, good Father. May you, by your spirit, orient yourself to us. We know that you have, and you would never leave us or forsake us. But be with us now as our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much. All right, good morning, Andrews University. All right. I already had several people ask me this morning if I got any sleep last night. The answer is yes, seven straight hours, which is like... I'm so happy. I'm, I, I tell you, I'm just so happy about that because yesterday I was really feeling kind of under it. I was like, man, I just need to recover here a little bit. And I mentioned I'm an eight-hour-a-night kind of guy. And so, you know, even seven is like not optimal, but I'm, I'm rejoicing about seven. I uh, was up early this morning and went to Andrew's Academy to do a little chapel talk there. I did the same thing six years ago when I was there, and I don't know. Who here went to Andrew's Academy? Anybody here Andrew's Academy? So you know on the side of the chapel there, there's, who was, was anybody there six years ago when I climbed the walls? I, can you remember this? So you can like, for those of you that are climbers, you can climb the walls inside the chapel at Andrew's Academy. It actually makes a really good traverse. And so they wanted me to do it again today. I'm like, what in the world? Leave me alone. And uh, then it, it gets even worse. The, <laughs> the, the, the dear guy that invited me over, I can't remember his name right now, he's like, oh, and by the way, for those of you that brought your skateboards, Pastor Asherick will be doing a demonstration right after chapel. I'm like, I'll be doing a what? I'm 47 years old. I was like, uh, I did the skateboarding thing when I was in my teens and 20s. And so all these eager, you know, kids like, oh, can you do a 360 kickflip? I'm like, on your, no way, I, not anymore. I mean, what you, <laughs> no, leave me alone. So it's, it's good to be back here where the expectations are more reasonable. Stand up front, say something that's sensible, and then leave us alone. So great to be here. I have thoroughly enjoyed my whole week. I want to give you a little preview of what's going to happen tonight. And then for those of you that will be around for the weekend, I'm also speaking, and a big shout out to Dwight and the team here at PMC for first service tomorrow morning here, and I'm going to be talking about the issue of identity. How do we move forward between what I'm, I don't want to give away my thunder here, but between what are the best versions of ourselves and those versions of ourselves that we all know that we have those moments where we're not at our best, and we've let ourselves down, we've let others down, and I'm going to talk about who we are and how we find our identity in that journey. So that'll be tomorrow morning for first service, and then my good friend Ty Gibson will speak for second service. Tonight, we're going to have something a little special. I'm actually super excited about it. I've got a book in my hand here that was just published by InterVarsity Press uh, this year, 2019, and it's titled Divine Impassibility, Four Views of God's Emotions and Suffering. And uh, what the book is, it's basically a collegial but vigorous debate between four ways of understanding how God relates to emotions and to suffering and to pain. One of the authors of this book is a dear friend of mine and also a professor here on campus at the seminary. His name is Dr. John Peckham. And uh, so what's going to happen tonight is the, the presentation that I'm going to give will be preceded by a podcast-like interview that I'm going to do with Dr. Peckham. I've already sort of teed him up about this, and I've said, Dr. P, I'm going to ask you three, perhaps four, extremely pointed questions. I'm going to put you on the spot big time, and he was sort of hesitant, and I said, you know, can I do that? Would you let me do that? Would you let me ask you the really hard questions about the question of suffering and the goodness of God and the ubiquity and depth of suffering? And so he has very graciously consented. And so tonight's going to be really awesome. We're going to get to hear from Dr. Peckham in an interview style. That will then segue into the presentation that I'm going to give, which I'm going to set up right now. Okay, I'm going to set that up right now. We've been describing all week. Our theme is what? Say it with me if you would. Beautiful and believable. Very good. And we've been, what I've been attempting to do, the degree to which I've been successful will be up for, you know, for you to determine 
but we're trying to enter into, or I've been trying to enter into that sort of intellectual, spiritual, emotional journey, cultural journey as well, that I was on as a 19, 20, 21, 22-year-old punk rocker coming for the first time to understand faith and all of the sort of questions that I wrestled with and struggled with. And we talked about the question of hell and the question of how God relates to the heathen or those that are, uh, don't have the opportunity to know about Jesus. We've wrestled through that. We talked about science and how we relate to the sort of scientific enterprise. And now we've come up hard against this idea of suffering. And this was sort of the, an obstacle would be too strong of a word because the truth of the matter is I did most of my coming to peace and coming to terms with God's relationship to suffering after I was baptized. And I mentioned that was June 6, 1996. I was a, you know, 23-year-old young person. And I knew enough, and I like to use the analogy of, of a marriage. And uh, I just was just telling uh, Levi and Brooke this morning this story. Um, I met my wife, and six weeks later, I asked her to marry me, right? So that's probably not advisable. Uh, some people are like, what? You're insane. You met this woman and you asked her to marry you six weeks later. Now, listen, we slowed way down. We weren't married for a few more months. Um, <laughs> but I tell you this, that sounds like really fast. But when I met this woman and I just tell people, look, when you know, you know, and I knew, I was ready to ask her to marry me within like six weeks, right? So I, I or six hours, I should say. So I exercised what I consider to be considerable restraint. And uh, now we've been married happily for 21 years. She's the love of my life. She's uh, my best friend. She's my second self. She's incredible. She, please, please, please. Amen. Amen. Yeah, she's, she's absolutely incredible. So as, as I tell my teenage boys, do as I say, not as I do, right? Right? So anyway, so I came into this relationship with, with Jesus and then with my wife and have been on this journey trying to understand who God is and, and go through life together. And now I'm the father of two incredible teenage boys. What I want to talk about this morning, setting up uh, what we're going to launch into tonight with Dr. Peckham in our uh, second presentation on suffering, is this, this question about the nature of suffering. Now, I know that's going to be a little hard for you to read there, but this is the uh, Twitter page or the Twitter homepage of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Does that name mean anything to anybody? Well-known, um, even famous, I think, would be an appropriate word, uh, particularly for an astrophysicist. I mean, the guy is quite famous. I told you the story earlier in the week about Franz, who came to my house, the theoretical physicist, and uh, who talked about how his own studies in science, he wasn't a Christian or from a Christian background, but his own sort of studies in science, in physics and theoretical physics actually led him to an understanding there must be something out there, some designing, intending purpose in the universe. Well, science is a funny thing because some people, it seems to teeter into confidence in the design of the universe and faith that is corollary with that, and others it seems to somehow tip out. And Neil deGrasse Tyson is one of those. And uh, earlier this year, I took a screenshot of this, Earlier this year, Neil deGrasse Tyson, it's a little bit hard to see it there, but he tweeted this, the universe is blind to our sorrows and indifferent to our pains. Have a nice day. Right? Now, the irony there is purposeful, right? It, you're, you're supposed to feel uneasy about that. How can I have a nice day when you've just announced that the universe is a cold, uncharitable, unfeeling place? Have a great day. Live your life. And it's right here, and I, I mentioned this yesterday, and I want to say it again. It's right here that people like myself and people like many of you or most of you, Christians, who affirm the goodness of God and the omnipotence of God come up hard against the preeminent question that irreligious or non-religious or even people that are hostile to religion, the question that they have, and that is, yeah, 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 I think that's a nice story. I wish it were true. But what do we do with the depth, the profundity, and the ubiquity of suffering in the world? And let's be honest. Many of us feel flat-footed by that question. We, we think there is an answer, and some of us might feel that we can give a part of an answer or the beginnings of that answer, but I don't think any of us 
would say that we are perfectly satisfied with the answer that we have to the question of suffering. I know I've written a book on the subject, and like the first thing I say is, I want you to know I'm not totally satisfied with what I've written here, but this is the best that we can do. And so you're sort of faced with kind of two options here. You can go the Neil deGrasse Tyson way where you basically say the, the universe is a cold, uncharitable, unfeeling, unsupervised place, have a nice day, or we can go the other way and say, well, maybe there is a way to intellectually, emotionally navigate affirming both the reality of suffering and of pain and also the goodness and existence of God. I believe that we can. Those are the three or four questions that I'm going to put very pointedly to Dr. Peckham tonight. And I'm frankly looking forward to see how he does, right? Now, he's a, he's a brilliant mind and an and a incredible person, but we're going to ask him what I regard as the toughest questions in the universe right now. So here we go. Suffering and pain are real. I'm going to just stop right there and just let you guys know there's no timer for me here, so I just need to know how much longer I can go. On that idea that suffering and pain are real, we've already said something that's controversial. I don't know if you knew that. There are people of various stripes, both of the religious and the irreligious variety, that deny even the existence or the reality of suffering, right? They say, no, suffering is um, illusory, it's uh, in the mind, there's, there's not a thing. And several years ago, I read this poem, and I don't know why, but it just got stuck in my mind, and, and I've remembered it ever since. And it goes like this. A certain faith healer from Deal asserted that pain is not real. Then please tell me why, came the patient's reply, when I sit on a pin and I puncture my skin, do I hate what I fancy I feel? That's cute. You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> you missed your cue there. The idea here is, is that there are certain worldviews that say uh, I believe incoherently that pain is not real, suffering is not real, it's illusory. And what the little poem suggests is, well, wait a minute, if pain is illusory, then why, why when I sit on a pin and I puncture my skin do I hate the thing that I think I'm feeling? And, and what if pain is, is deeper than just the, the sitting on a pin or the, the you know, knocking your, your shin on a skateboard or whatever? What if there's like real deep pain, emotional pain? This morning I I told a story that I don't think I'm going to go into here. At least that's not the plan. I, I told the story of my own journey through having not one, not two, but three dads. Right? Three dads. I never met my biological father. I did mention that briefly. Um, interestingly, my biological father's name was Frank Cross, which in a way I would prefer that as a preacher's name. I mean, can you imagine? Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker tonight, David Cross. Yeah, I just love that. So, uh, never met him, uh, reached out to him a couple times. He wasn't very interested. So then, my second father, uh, I had a name for 10 years of my life. My name was David Dormany, D-O-R-M-I-N-E-Y. That was my name. I used to have to spell it. I wrote it on my test. That was my name. And then it wasn't until I was in my early teens that I got a dad, like a real dad, like an actual dad. And I, I will say this. Because I'd already been adopted once, and I bore the name of somebody who wasn't even my biological father, but he was the biological father of my younger brother, same mom, different dads, and he not only left me, and I wasn't his son, he left my brother when I was sort of nine-ish, ten-ish, and my brother was three years younger. And so imagine the sort of sadness associated with having a name that's not your biological name, and the name of somebody who decided not to stick around, right? That's an unattractive proposition, and I am absolutely certain that there are other people in here who have similar stories of, of woe and of brokenness in your family. Now, the good news for me is, in my early teens, my mom met this incredible guy named Richard Asherick, and she did something very wise. She said to both my brother and I that she was not going to insist, because she's marrying him, she said, look, I'm not going to insist that you're adopted by Richard. He was, we were very cautious about him. And frankly, he was incredible. He loved my mom. He loved us. And my brother and I, and I'll just tell you this last little bit, a year, about a year after my mom married Richard, and we just called him Richard, I was sitting in my room sort of 
ruminating on the very thing I'm talking to you about now, that I bear the name of somebody who I don't even know where they're at. I've never seen him since. He's left. He's left my brother. He's gone. And I loved this guy. And I thought, the most important thing is that he loves my mom. And so I just decided in that moment, I'm going to be adopted. That's a true story, what I'm going to tell you. It's one of those moments where God nods. Where's, where's Taylor? I'm looking for Taylor. One of those moments where you, you get the nod. I get up out of my room. I go walking down the hallway to my brother. So I'm 13. My brother's um, 10 or 11, depending on what time of the year it was. I go down the hallway. My brother comes out of his room, and I say, hey, Rob, I have something I want to tell you. He's just an, this incredible guy. I love my brother. And he said, I think I know what it is. And I said, yeah, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? And he said, I want to be adopted. I was like, I just made that decision myself. He said, yeah, me too. Independent of one another, on the same day, at the same time, in the same house, we both decided without any solicitation from our mom or our new dad, and we walked out, I'll never forget this, we walked out and we, we, we had this conversation with my mom and my new dad and said, we have both just decided now, independently, that we'd like to be adopted. And my new dad began to cry. And I tell you this, it is an honor for me to bear the name Asherick. I, it's a little weird. It's a bit of a weird name. I concede that. Um, but I chose this name, and I love this name. But here's the interesting thing. There are people in here whose story is easier than mine, and there are people in here whose story is tougher than mine. You didn't even get a dad in your teens. You didn't get a guy that, that you know, took care of your mom and took care of you. And, and the point is... The existence of suffering, the reality of suffering comes in all different kinds. It can be familial, it can be physical, it can be social. It, it, there's all different kinds of suffering. And so I want to say again here that I am not among the, the, the class of people that denies the existence of the reality of suffering. No, I am persuaded, like I'm certain all of you are as well, that suffering is real, that it's a thing, that it's a tragic and terrible thing. And so I say here... Suffering and pain are real. The question is, for me, this is the question, ultimately, are they meaningful or meaningless? Because the reality and the ubiquity of the suffering, I believe, cannot be coherently denied. And it's right at this point that we encounter really challenging, really provocative, and frankly, sometimes upsetting passages of Scripture like this. Uh, we've been spending quite a little bit of time in Romans. This could have been extracted from some other places in Scripture, but I thought because we've spent some considerable time in Romans, I'll go there. Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul makes this almost on the face of it absurd argument, but where he goes with it's incredible. But it starts in a kind of absurdity. He says, we rejoice in our sufferings. Yeah, right. Right? Like, really? We rejoice in our sufferings. We tolerate our sufferings. We endure our sufferings. We make peace with our sufferings. Yes, and yes, and yes. But we rejoice in our sufferings. Please, Paul, by all means, further this argument. Persuade me because I am incredulous, right? I'm skeptical about this notion. We rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. He's going somewhere here now. And character produces hope. And hope will not, in the end, put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so if you were going to graph this or put this in a kind of schematic, it would, it would look like this. Paul makes this persuasive argument. Now, it's not absolutely conclusive, but it is persuasive that suffering has an effect Adversity does something to the human spirit. Much of the great music, much of the great art, uh, many of the greatest works that have, that have been accomplished in human history have been born out of not prosperity and ease and leisure, but out of adversity and pain and suffering. The great Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran in his book The Prophet said, the waters of our happiness are only as deep as the well of our sorrow. There is some artistic developmental process and progression that happens when they're suffering. I'll give you a case in point, reverting back to the story I was just telling you about my, my, my childhood and uh, the sense of abandonment and then the second sense of abandonment. I'll tell you a fascinating thing happened. When Violetta and I had children, I told my wife with tears running down my cheeks when we found out she was pregnant. 
I said, sweetheart, I'm going to be a great dad. I'm just committed. I, I'm just going to be the best dad there ever was. I'm just going to, I don't know how many children we're going to have. It's turned out to be two incredible teenage boys who are literally, and I'm not exaggerating, and if they were here today, they would tell you the same. They are my best friends in the world. I love these boys. I pour my life into these boys. I, I tell you, something happened. I don't know if I would have had that same resolve and conviction and, and certitude about being a great dad if I had had a mediocre dad or even a good dad. I might have just been sort of passe about it, laissez-faire. But out of my adversity and out of my pain and out of my suffering, I encountered a resolve and a passion and a conviction. I'm going to be a great dad. And so Paul makes this point. He says, out of suffering comes endurance, and then endurance turns us into, this is a hard thing to say, and it's a hard thing to bear. It turns us into better versions of ourselves. It, it produces character, and when we see that we are becoming better versions of ourselves, this gives us a sense of hope that maybe, contrary to Neil deGrasse Tyson's assertion, maybe there is something out in the universe to which we are trending in our upward path. And then he says, yes, that thing is the love of God. Now, I don't pretend that in five minutes through a quick, you know, treatment of Romans chapter 5 that we have just solved all the problems. No, no, we've not even, we've just begun this conversation. But here we can at least make, I think, a reasonable case for the fact that the existence of suffering and the profundity of suffering can be at least explained or defended, but there's still big questions. And years ago, I read a book written, funnily enough, by an Australian, an Australian lawyer. Uh, the book was called God, actually, published by the Australian Broadcast Company, which is like the equivalent of the BBC. So it's the ABC, BBC. And uh, the book is incredible. He comes as a convert to Christianity, as a convert away from a really, you know, rampant sort of secular Australian perspective. He becomes a follower of Jesus, and he tells the story in the book, God Actually. And he brings about several, because he's, he's not trained as a theologian, he brings several lines of argument to bear on the question of suffering that frankly were new to me, like cool ideas, insights. I want to share one of them with you here today. You may or may not find this persuasive. I find it hugely persuasive. And it's actually sort of related to one of the tough questions I'm going to ask Dr. Peckham tonight. Here's what Roy Williams says. The quotation's a little long, but you'll be able to follow it because it's very easy to access. He says, all right, here we go. What could have been the alternative to a world in which suffering and evil exist? Let's imagine maybe there's another option out there. It is crucial to come to grips with this issue. Much modern-day hostility toward religion and toward God, I would add, seems to be grounded on a pivotal assumption, right? What is that assumption, Mr. Williams? That any God who chooses to permit suffering is not worthy of worship and should be repudiated, right? Probably Neil deGrasse Tyson and certainly others like him would say, absolutely. But watch where Williams goes with this. But implicit in that assumption is a further assumption that God, if he exists, must have had viable alternatives to choose from, right? Like there were other choices he could have made, and he made a bad choice. But William says, I believe that assumption to be false. And then he goes down this fascinating little thought experiment. And I, this was a new idea to me, new concept, I think coherently argued and absolutely brilliant. He says, ah, come with me. Imagine a world, say, in which... No one could die before the age of 12. Just to pause on that. Because we all know the particular pain and poignancy we feel when not just somebody in their 20s or 30s or 40s dies, but when a child dies, when a child gets cancer, when a child, you know, we all feel that. And, and we just, we rage against it internally and we say, that's not right, that's unjust. And there are some, again, that tip out of faith and out of any empathy toward religion or to God because they say, if there was a God, that kind of stuff wouldn't happen. And William says, just, let me just challenge you on that. And where he goes with this is frankly challenging. He says, imagine a world in which no one could die before the age of 12. Ah, that's a better world, isn't it? That's a much better world. So you would think. But watch where Williams goes. 
A world in which a supposedly more loving God, quote, spared the innocent at least for a fixed time. Would that be a better world? Now, I think most of us on the surface of it would say that'd be a much better world. Williams gives a, an emphatic answer. He says, no. The possibility that such a world could work satisfactorily really does not hold up for even a moment. Children of a certain age would be known to be indestructible. And then he says, and with what results? What would that world look like? Let's, let's pretend. Let's go down that path. Parents would not care for them so painstakingly, right? They're impervious to death. They can't die. So now parental care and parental tenderness is compromised, nor love them with the, such protective tenderness. All kinds of monstrous evils, short of death, would be all the more likely to be visited upon them by their parents and by others. And what would happen on the day when the child turned 12 and was all of a sudden subject to the same risk of death as everyone else? How would the child cope with that situation and transition? How would anyone go about preparing the child for that situation? There are no good answers to those questions. And this may well give us a clue to reconciling the existence of a loving God with other hideous and seemingly capricious events that bring about pain and suffering. And he says this, there is no workable alternative to a world with suffering in it. The potential for suffering was and is an inevitable feature of the universe given the nature of the God who created it. There are no options. There are no alternatives even for God. And then this final sentence here from Williams, he says, the fact that suffering occurs is proof not of God's non-existence, but of his wisdom. Now, that is a paradigm shift. Back to Neil deGrasse Tyson's idea. The universe is indifferent to your pain and your sorrows. Have a nice day. Are you so sure? Now, I would not even, you know, pretend to be able to hold court with, with Tyson on issues of science or physics or any other such thing. But, but here, here I, I want to I issue a, a bit of a caution that just because somebody is a brilliant scientist doesn't mean they're a particularly good philosopher, right, or a particularly good theologian. How can you be so sure that the universe, with a capital U, is indifferent to my pain and my suffering and my sorrow? How do we know that maybe not something closer to what Paul describes is more accurate, that actually suffering brings about a response to suffering which creates endurance and turns us into somehow better versions of ourselves which creates character which then gives us hope that maybe there is some meaning or purpose or trajectory to even the difficulties of life that will eventually redound and, and finish in the great truth that God is love. How would we go about measuring that? To what temperature do we heat the Bunsen burner uh, to, uh, to arrive at... He does, uh, DeGrasse Tyson is not making a scientific claim. He's making a philosophical claim. And my question remains, yes, suffering exists, but is it meaningful or is it meaningless? Now, another crucial question that grows out of that is this question. Can God relate to our suffering and pain or is he immune to such things? And that is the very question that Peckham takes up in this book. As one of the four authors, he takes the perspective, and I'm not going to steal any of his thunder, but that... that God is able to relate to, in some authentic level, our pain, even in his divinity. Ellen White says it this way. In The Desire of Ages, she says, Not a sigh is breathed. Not a pain is felt. Not a grief pierces the soul. And look at this poetic language here. But the throb vibrates the Father's heart. I want to close on a, a story. Several years ago, I, we, my, we've always been camping family. Camping, backpacking, rock climbing, fly fishing. It's just, just what we do as a family. It's sort of our jam. And several years ago, we were in New Zealand, which is the best country in the southern hemisphere, by the way. Uh, second best country on earth. 
Um, and we were backpacking all throughout New Zealand, just having the time of our lives. Our boys would have been probably at this, we've been there several times, maybe they were 13. I think Landon was about 13. Uh, he was just coming into manhood. You know, well, you'll find one day, and for those of you that are parents in here, you'll know what I'm describing if you have teenage children. One day you look into the face of your child and you see a man. And you just can see that something happened almost overnight. And so he was just coming in. He was starting to get those little man muscles. And his face was, you know, getting a little cut in his cheek. And, and I, it was like, wow, I have a, my son is a man now. He's becoming a man. And uh, we were off camp somewhere in the beautiful back country of the South Island. And uh, we were all sleeping in a tent, as we do, and, and crowded into our little tent on our sleeping mats. And for reasons I don't know, I can't explain this, um, I'm not sure anybody could. Um, my oldest son, Landon, has had headaches. Um, it's nothing serious that we know of, but he has migraines. Anybody else in here migraine suffer? Okay, my heart goes out to you. Um, I've never had headaches, really. I've had ice cream headaches. Uh, those are terrible. Um, but my son has headaches, and this was right about the time where he was starting to have his first one or two now, you need to understand, my son, my oldest son, is tough as nails. Like, he's not a complainer. He's a dude. And one night, um, when we were camping in the backcountry, so we're miles away from any sort of medical help. I mean, there's just not, it's just part of the, the way it works. And we're just having a great time. But, but I, I, I hear my son moaning, and he, he grabs me, and he's like, Dad, Dad. And I'm like, yeah, 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 what is it, Lana? What is it? We're all in our little sleeping bags. Dad, my head, and my son, I might get a little might get a little emotional here. My, my son is like crying, and you can just detect something is really wrong. I'm like, Lana, what, what is it? What's going on? Dad, my head, my head. And he's, he's, really, he's like kind of heaving, and, and he's like, my head, my head. And I'm like, uh, and we've already learned that like the Tylenol, Panadol thing, that's not doing any. That's not even going to touch it. So I'm like, Lana, and this was maybe only the second or the third one he'd ever had, and so this was like sort of a worry. And I'm like, are, are, you, are you okay? Are, he said, and then he says, Dad, just hold me. So I take my muscular little man-child <laughs> into my arms, and he's, he's heaving with crying and pain, and, and this goes on for an hour or two before he finally slips back into sleep. And I can, I can just tell you this. That was one of those moments in your life. You have those moments where you're like, I will never not remember how I feel right now. As a father holding your son who's in incredible pain and who's, who's doing his best, best to be brave and to receive that pain so as not to wake up his brother and mom who were also in the tent. I can tell you that I could not feel his pain. But my heart throbbed with his every sob, with his every, with his every whimper, with his every shudder of his frame. I, my heart could feel his pain. And when he finally, finally fell asleep and he woke up the next day and he was fine and, and it was incredible, but I want to tell you this. She says, not a sigh is breathed, not a pain is felt, not a grief pierces the soul, but throbs your father's Heart. Can God relate to our pain? That is the question, and it is the question to which we will turn our attention tonight. Beloved, I want to tell you something. Life is hard. Life is difficult, and pain and suffering cannot be denied. The question is, is it meaningful or meaningless? Can God relate to our pain and to our suffering? I believe the answer is yes. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, help us to enter into a relationship not just with a father and not just with a good father, but with you, our good, good father, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen.